Okay. So my name is Mads Walensky. Uh, I am the director of the Center for Ethics, Economics, and Public Policy here at the University of San Diego. And it's my pleasure to welcome you today to this discussion with Ed Dolan, uh, co-sponsored by the Ms. Cannon Center. Um, our topic for today is Economic and Social Reforms for a Pandemic and Beyond, Cash Assistance and Universal Basic Income. And uh, what we're going to be discussing are the various federal relief measures that have been taken to help Americans cope with the economic impact of COVID-19. Uh, as most of you are aware, uh, in March, uh, March 27th, the United States government passed into uh, activity the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, otherwise known as the CARE Act, which was a $2.2 trillion bill, um, the largest economic relief package in U.S. history, uh, with money set aside for hospitals, distressed industries, small businesses, um, and an expansion of the federal unemployment insurance program, uh, as well as the element with which most of you are probably familiar, a one-time $1,200 payment uh, to all individuals making income less than $75,000 a year. So most Americans received cash payment from the United States government with no strings attached for them to spend on whatever they needed to help them with this crisis. Um, as the crisis has dragged on, uh, it has become apparent that that one-time payment is probably not going to be sufficient uh, to help most Americans make it through this difficult time uh, and so there are now a number of similar follow-up bills working their way through Congress. We have the Heroes Act um, uh, under the directorship of uh, Nancy Pelosi, uh, which is a $3 trillion bill, um, which is designed to extend and amplify the measures of the CARES Act. Uh, and there are a number of competing measures as well, uh, all of which have in common something with which just six months ago would have seemed unprecedented, which is to say, massive, uh, no strings attached cash payments from the federal government directly to American citizens. Uh, you see this on both sides of the aisle. So uh, on the progressive uh, Democratic side of, uh, of Congress, you have Camilla Jayapal, uh, who has a bill uh, in place that would provide coverage for workers' salaries up to $90,000 um, for six months. Uh, on the other side of the aisle, you have Josh Hawley, uh, who's proposing to cover 80% of employers' payroll uh, up to the median wage of about $49,000 a year. Uh, again, on the far left progressive side, you have Senators Harris uh, and Sanders proposing to pay Americans directly $2,000 a month until three months after the crisis has passed. Uh, and on the far right side of the aisle, the libertarian aisle, uh, you have Justin Amash, uh, who is proposing similar cash payments uh, to individuals. Um, so there is a kind of unprecedented moment taking place now um, in the United States. Uh, previously, uh, Americans have been very skeptical about cash payments, about the expense involved in cash payments, about the worry that um, cash payments would discourage work. Um, and there's still some of that uh, going on. So we have uh, some senators who call this a kind of radical socialist idea. Uh, and think that we should uh, not touch it with a 10-foot pole. Um, but uh, there seems to be a wide consensus here that something has to be done and that previously untouchable political measures um, now might be uh, our best shot at, at helping us through an, an unprecedented and difficult time. So to help us talk through some of these issues today, uh, we're very grateful to have Ed Dolan with us. Uh, Ed Dolan is uh, an economist. He has a PhD in economics from Yale University. Uh, he has taught at a number of different colleges throughout the United States and elsewhere, including Dartmouth College, the University of Chicago, George Mason University, Gettysburg College. Uh, he taught for 11 years in Moscow, Russia, uh, where he and his wife founded the American Institute of Business and Economics, uh, an independent not-for-profit MBA program. Uh, after that, he's taught in various European countries, including the University of Budapest, uh, the University of Economics in Prague. Uh, he's now a senior fellow at the Niskanen Center uh, and uh, is somebody whose work I admire very much. Um, I've, I've 
known and admired Edwards for a long time. I've never yet met him in person, and I guess I still haven't met him in person, but this is the closest that I've gotten. Um, he's written widely on environmental policy, on problems of economic transition from socialism in the former Soviet Union, and of course, um, most relevant to today's topic, he's written a, a great deal of really, really interesting material on cash transfers, social safety net, and the idea of universal basic income. So uh, it's my pleasure to turn things over to Ed. Um, for those of you who want to participate in this discussion by asking questions, please submit those questions um, to the panelists or to me in the chat. Uh, I'll keep track of those questions as we go along. And then after uh, Ed's done with this presentation, we'll have a discussion. I'll ask him some questions of my own, and I'll pass on some of your questions to him as well to ask. So uh, without any further ado, let's turn things over to Ed Dolan. Okay, uh, I guess I'm on screen here. So um, let me uh, th thank you for arranging this thing. This is a experiment with Coast to Coast Collaboration co-hosted by two, uh, two organizations that almost managed to fit together seamlessly today. Uh, so uh, I'd like to start off with just a little bit of a slideshow. So let me switch to share screen here and we'll uh, run through that. Okay, so um, I'd like to start out here our discussion of the social safety net uh, by looking at a little bit of the reason that we're in such a stressed period entering into this crisis. Uh, any kind of crisis shows the gaps in your systems pretty rapidly, and that's been true for this one too. Um, Let's start off looking at the position we're starting from entering this. This chart and the next one I'm going to show, show position of the US economy uh, at the end of 2019, just before the COVID virus arrived. We can see here, this first chart shows distribution of household wealth, that is uh, household net worth, assets minus liabilities. And we can see here from this red line on top, that the top 1% of the economy has been doing pretty well. In fact, uh, they um, managed to increase their, uh, more than double their net worth over the past 30 years and about double it over the last, uh, since the last crisis. People in the middle, uh, the 51st and 90th percentile and the uh, 91st to 99th percentile been doing okay too. They've also managed to increase their net worth. The problem is down here at the bottom, this blue line that you can almost not see uh, that uh, because it coincides so closely with the horizontal axis shows the position of the bottom half of the population. We're not talking here about uh, the officially designated poor, the 12% or so of the U.S. population that, that are in absolute poverty. This is the entire bottom half of the population. You can't even see them on this diagram. So um, I'm going to um, change the axis so we can see it. We'll switch from a linear axis, goes 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 to a uh, logarithmic action axis here that goes 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, a million, and so forth. And that spreads out um, the uh, chart a little bit since the top 1% has uh, almost exactly a thousand times as much net worth per household as the bottom half. <laughs> we see something on here which we didn't see before, which is that it's not only that the bottom half has less wealth than the top 1% or the top 10%, but also that their wealth is much more fragile. We can see in the last recession, which was already the worst recession uh, since the Great Depression, but uh, not as bad as the one we're going into now, not as the one that we're already in now, I should say. Back in the last depression, recession, we see that while the top 10% lost about a quarter of their net worth, they quickly regained it and by now are better than they were going into the recession. We get down there to the bottom half, we see that the bottom half were really hammered in the last recession, lost 87% of their wealth, which means that a large part of the people in the bottom half uh, went down to zero to complete personal insolvency. 
And furthermore, we see that the bottom half of the population has not yet regained the ground it lost in the last recession. Uh, so we're in a weak place going into this crisis. Half the population is living close to the edge. And this close to the edge means that we have a real challenge to face. We need to design a social safety net that works not only in a crisis like this, but one that works in normal times because our safety net also was already was doing poorly in normal times. We need a safety net that's responsive, that's fair, and that's work friendly. Uh, was the safety net up to the challenge? Well, um, it wasn't all bad. Uh, to its credit, the Congress acted very rapidly in this recession. We see back here the first uh, action by Congress, the so-called Families First Act, uh, authorized emergency sick leave and some other provisions. The, the curve of cases was barely uh, budged by then. And the $2 trillion CARES Act came along uh, still uh, before we'd even reached uh, 25,000 cases here. So the response was reasonably rapid. And another thing that I would say is positive about the initial response was that most of the aid that was dispensed took the form of cash, which is by far the most useful uh, thing in a crisis since people's needs. Some people need to eat, some people need to pay their rent, some people need to pay their mortgage and so forth. Uh, on top of that, the Fed acted very quickly to support uh, the uh, financial system and states pitched in and helped with some mortgage and rent freezes. So far, so good. But there's some important buts here. One of the buts was that the payments were not as fast as promised. Uh, we had this CARES Act passed two months ago. People are just now getting, uh, the lucky ones are just now getting their benefits. Um, uh, my wife and I got our payments, in fact, just a couple days ago, only eight weeks late. Uh, for us, uh, that wasn't a strain uh, since we are lucky enough not to have a rent or a mortgage to pay, but eight weeks was a lot for some people to wait. Furthermore, a lot of people haven't got uh, their payments yet. Uh, if there are people that don't file income taxes regularly, such as many Social Security recipients, people who have poor banking relations, such as many poor people, uh, aren't getting their payments. And some people have been told, even though they got their adult payments, they're not going to get their child allowances till next year. On top of the individual allowance, we had this payroll protection plan. Payroll protection plan was a good concept. It's been used successfully in some European countries. But our version was underfunded and poorly targeted. Uh, as we know, many big firms got in line first and got money they shouldn't have. The Secretary of the Treasury has promised to fix this, is threatened uh, to sue or take administrative action against firms that got money they can't deserve. But today's New York Times say that some of these big companies uh, are thumbing their nose at him and think that he doesn't going to be able to do anything. Uh, meanwhile, many small firms, especially those with weak banking connections, failed to get the aid they were promised. And probably the worst idea of all, in my opinion, on the um, the response to the pandemic was the idea of linking on linking aid to unemployment insurance. Unemployment insurance is not really designed to dispense aid. Unemployment insurance, unemployment insurance systems are designed to weed out fraud and not to disperse aid. They want to check to make sure that people uh, really lost their jobs, didn't quit them. They want to make sure that people don't are st continue looking for work, which is absurd since there are no jobs to look for now. The systems are run on the state level. Many of the systems are antiquated. They use software that was written back in the 1980s. They're understaffed after years of low unemployment claims. They've been very slow to process claims. And they, in many states, they've completely failed uh, to make necessary changes like making unemployment insurance available to gig workers. So what do we need? What would, what would we like to have? What would work better? Uh, to me, the number one thing that we need 
uh, to respond to a crisis is we need a system that's always on, like your TV. Everybody knows when you sit down in front of your TV, you pick up your remote, you push the button, and the picture appears immediately. Uh, why does that happen? That happens because your television is already on, even when it's off. Uh, if you ever have a power outage or if you unplug your TV and plug it back in again, you know it takes 10 or 15 minutes to come up, especially if you're connected to a cable box. Um, we want uh, our welfare system that's always on, which means that we want eligibility and enrollment that's already automated, permanent, and operating in the backgrounds. In normal times, our safety net system would provide uh, background support uh, at a moderate level uh, as it's needed in a prospering economy. In a crisis, the system parameters could be tweaked at the push of a button to fit the unexpected. And I'll explain as we go along exactly what I mean by some of those tweaks. My name for an always on system like this is integrated cash assistance. Integrated cash assistance would have three main elements. First of all, it would have a basic grant uh, that would be similar to uh, universal basic income, although we'll see not quite exactly uh, a canonical UBI. Um, a integrated cash assistant would have a high income phase out. Uh, in that regard, it would somewhat resemble a negative income tax and uh, would also have a wage subsidy component to EIT, uh, similar to the earned income tax credit. So I'd like to explain how each of these components would work in normal times and then how they'd work in a crisis. So what's the function of the basic grant in normal times? Basic grant function of that in normal times would be to replace conventional means tested cash and in-kind welfare, such as food stamps and TANF. Um, food stamps we see have been around since 1939. They haven't changed that much, except that we've replaced these cute little stamps with debit cards. It's time to replace them. Um, the means tested programs we have now are helpful, of course. Uh, they're estimated to raise about 44% of the population out of poverty, people who would otherwise be poor without these means tested program. But an integrated cash assistance could do better than that, even if its basic grant were as small as half of the poverty level, that is as small as $500 a month, considerably less than has been discussed by uh, people like uh, Andrew Yang's um, uh, basic income that he campaigned on. In a crisis, the basic grant would have some different functions. First of all, uh, because it was in an always on position, the basic grant could be raised as needed and we would need more now. People need something they can live on, pay their rent with and so forth. Uh, so we'd probably want to ramp it up from $500 a month to $1,000, $1,200, whatever Congress and their wisdom sees as needed. There'd be no waiting because eligibility and payment arrangements would already be established. Everybody would either have a registered bank account or they would have some place like the post office uh, that they would uh, be able to go to regularly to pick up a debit card. Uh, and this enhanced basic grant in a crisis would serve as income replacement for people who had lost their job. It would also serve a very important uh, public health role because it would provide income replacement for supported isolation of people who've been exposed to the virus. What's the role of the second element, the phase out? <laughs> um, in integrated cash assistance system here, the basic grant would be subject to a high income phase out, just like uh, the $1,200 bonus um, that's being paid out now. Uh, main point of that would be partly because uh, the people in the upper half, as we saw from our early charts, don't really need the money, and uh, partly to relieve the strain on the budget, which obviously is considerable already. Uh, Milton Friedman's classic negative income stack started the phase out 
uh, right at zero, shown by the line uh, GN here, the dashed line on this diagram. But a more modern version would start the phase out at uh, probably at some higher break even point somewhere around the poverty line. The per reason to start the phase out later would be that it would give a stronger work incentive to low wage workers. And speaking of work incentives, why do we need more work incentives? How does the basic grant feed into work incentives? Well, by replacing the current means, in the basic grant, in my view, would replace means-tested programs, not be stacked on top of them. And as we can see from this diagram, which comes from the Congressional Budget Office, the blue line here shows that uh, conventional welfare programs as they exist now have very high benefit reduction rates, uh, especially for people right around the poverty level, just below it and just above it, the critical point where people are just emerging from welfare dependency into self-sufficiency, um, the uh, benefit reduction rates can approach 80%, so that people are only keeping 20 cents on the dollar from every dollar they earn. That's inadequate uh, work incentives. Work incentives on this diagram are shown by the slope of these various lines, and we can see that the green dashed UBI line here, basic income line, uh, is quite a bit steeper throughout its range than the blue line showing existing welfare programs. Work incentives are a problem under the CARES Act. Now, for the moment, we're not feeling that too acutely, or perhaps I should say we're just beginning to feel it um, because there haven't been any jobs. But uh, these uh, aid programs that are administered through the unemployment insurance, uh, as this chart shows, for low income workers ranging from workers earning less than uh, $30 in uh, California to uh, people earning less than $18 in uh, Mississippi, uh, people right now are getting more money from their unemployment uh, than they will if they go back to work. Um, that uh, is going to be a problem as we start to opening up, as people find their jobs are there, they're gonna experience a drop in income when they go back to their job, and uh, that's not as it should be. To further enhance the wage subsidies in an integrated cash income system, I recommend including uh, a wage subsidy somewhat similar to the earned income tax credit. This would be a, a system that would give a bonus to low wage workers uh, of a, add two or three extra dollars an hour to their uh, wage. Uh, that would continue up to somewhere around the poverty level at which it would enter a pause just as the earned income tax credit, and then it would be gradually be uh, phased out for high earners. Uh, the purpose of this in normal times would be to, bo again, boost work incentives for people that are making the least money, people that are making uh, self uh, the transition to self-sufficiency. Uh, they're working at minimum wage jobs, but trying to work their way up the ladder to something a little better than that. Um, <clears throat> the eff effect of this um, wage subsidy would be considerably greater if it were paid out as monthly cash bonus, by the way, rather than as an annual tax credit as the earned income tax credit is, but that's another story for another time. In a pandemic, the wage subsidy would have a little bit of a different uh, function. It would be a flexible tool which could be used to accomplish very quickly and fully some aims which are being accomplished now in part or being only discussed. Uh, for one thing, the wage subsidy rate in a crisis could be ways raised to give a bonus to low paid essential workers. Uh, some of you may be aware of the proposal that Mitt Romney has been made for what he calls Patriot pay, which would raise the pay of low wage essential workers to a minimum of $22 an hour. Um, some people call that hero pay, he calls it Patriot pay, but the idea is that we give 
uh, the low wage workers, the people that we hardly notice, like the people that bring the packages to the door for UPS, uh, from UPS or Federal Express, um, the uh, clerks at the grocery store, the low paid workers, the janitors, parking lot attendants at our hospitals, um, this would give them uh, their uh, hero pay. And um, it could also be arranged uh, to fill in uh, for the function of uh, payroll, uh, um, continuous payroll mechanism, payroll protection. Uh, if workers, low wage workers considered continued to receive their wage subsidies or even enhanced wage subsidy during the pandemic, uh, that would give them uh, the same money that they're now getting through these ad hoc $1,200 grants or the $600 a month payroll bonus. It would preserve work incentives and uh, wouldn't have all the gimmickry and the worries about whether or not it would apply to gig workers and so forth. So when we put the complete uh, integrated cash assistance together, we have a uh, basic grant regardless of employment status. Uh, some people think that uh, that should be separate adult grant plus a separate child grant. That's an optional feature. We'd have a phase out for high earners. We'd have a wage subsidy for low earners. So to sum up here, uh, to get on, uh, the idea of this integrated cash assistance in normal times would be to have more cash programs for greater flexibility, fewer in-kinds program, uh, replace uh, many of our uh, income, uh, means-tested income security programs, both in-kind and cash. Uh, health and education programs would remain. This wouldn't take, uh, wouldn't uh, replace every element of the social safety net. We still have a uh, need for a uh, health care system, which needs to be upgraded also. Actually, uh, Niskanen has a, a special briefing coming up a week from Wednesday on the 20th about that. If you wanted to listen in, uh, I'll be giving a presentation on what should happen to the health care plan. plan. Um, but we'd have less means testing, lower benefit reduction rate, phase out for high earners to re, uh, minimize the budgetary impacts and focus benefits on the neediest, and wage subsidy for lowest earners to give maximum work incentives. Um, in the next pandemic, uh, we would have the always on feature that would bring pandemic aid online faster. Uh, basic grant and wage subsidy be a balanced uh, uh, adjusted to give a better balance between uh, the need for work incentives, the need for uh, hero pay to essential workers, and at the same time to retain uh, the necessary public health needs for uh, wage, uh, some kind of income subsidies for people who are being uh, asked or required to leave their jobs in order to uh, stay at home. And uh, because uh, all of the uh, rules and regulations would be worked out in advance, there would be less risk that aid would be diverted to people who are less in need. Um, that's what I got to say. This uh, set of slides are gonna be posted eventually. Uh, they'll be posted on uh, my own website, Ed Dolan's econ blog, and probably here and there elsewhere too. So I've stuck on uh, some uh, recommendations for um, additional reading. So I'm going to turn off the slideshow now. I think we're ready to go to Q&A. Outstanding. Thank you very much, Ed. That was, a, that was a terrific presentation. So as a reminder to those of you in attendance, uh, if you'd like to ask a question of Ed, uh, please put that in the chat. Uh, and uh, Ed or I will pick up on that. And uh, I'll, I'll try to monitor the chat myself and uh, pose as many of these questions as I can to Ed. Um, we've got one comment in there already, but just to get things kicked off here, uh, I have a question of my own. So one of the ideas that I found most interesting in um, your recent piece on this topic for the Niskanen Center, uh, you wrote an article called The Social Safety Net for an Age of Uncertainty. And in that article, you discuss uh, an idea that you call the safety net trilemma. So you, you note that there are these three 
values or goals that we would like a social safety net to achieve both in normal times and in times of the pandemic. And that it's difficult um, to achieve all three of those goals simultaneously. Um, and uh, if I recall correctly, the goals that you mentioned were uh, first that we have a safety net that provides people with an adequate level of income security. So ideally you wanna raise them up to the federal poverty level or at least out of deep poverty. Um, you want to provide people with work incentives um, and you want the program to be uh, affordable in a sustainable way. So could you say a little bit about that trilemma, why there's a tension between those goals and how your proposal of integrated cash assistance uh, helps us resolve that trilemma to the extent that it can be resolved? Yeah, uh, okay, well, of course, um, I think I've, I've come to the conclusion that um, we really need some kind of a compromise among these goals. I'm uh, very sympathetic uh, to the people who are in favor, for example, of a pure uh, universal basic income. Uh, that's a commendable goal and there's a lot to be said for it. And as I've written over and over again in the past, a pure uh, canonical uh, universal basic income that gave money to everyone um, would uh, certainly be an improvement over the fragmented uh, mixed in-kind welfare system that we have now. Uh, but uh, there is definitely no doubt about the fact that a uh, universal basic income that was high enough to raise everybody out of poverty uh, would involve uh, quite large income transfers uh, through the budget. And unfortunately, as we economists know, income transfers are a bit of a leaky budget because if we uh, tax uh, wealthy people and then turn around and give the same money right back to them, we not only introduce administrative costs of doing that, but we also introduce some uh, disincentives and some, uh, uh, in, uh, you know, whether they're for uh, work or investment or so forth. So we'd like to evade those and that's the purpose of the phase, in, phase out element that um, many uh, UBI advocates accept. Um, with regard to work incentives, people are, um, some people are skeptical about the work incentives, uh, whether the work incentives that are inherent in a pure universal basic income are adequate. Uh, again, I think that they, for low income people, they'd be considerably stronger than they are now. But uh, many people are keen on uh, some idea of a wage subsidy that would give an even stronger incentive uh, for people at low income levels, similar to the earned income tax credit, which in its own way has been successful, except that the earned income tax credit has two really big flaws to me. One is that it's not available for people without uh, children or at least hardly available for people without children and um, because it's paid only once a year as a tax credit it's not very flexible and doesn't do its job as well as it should so uh, really uh, we live in a democratic system um, the um, anything we get um, is going to be some kind of a compromise and i think that by uh, sitting people down and discussing these, that this is a framework that we can discuss our uh, different needs and preferences in a way that will allow us to form a majority coalition to introduce something that would be a big improvement over what we have now, even though it wouldn't satisfy uh, the ideal of every individual. Great. So, um... Harriet Baber uh, asked a question in the chat about uh, work incentives that follows up nicely to this point about the safety net trilemma. So if we have to, in some sense, choose between providing an adequate level of income support, uh, providing a, uh, a safety net that's uh, affordable, and providing people with adequate work incentives, um, how important are work incentives going to be going forward in the wake of this pandemic? Uh, you know, Andrew Yang and a lot of other supporters of the idea of a basic income guarantee make a big deal about technological automation and the idea that uh, the robots are essentially going to put us all out of work eventually. It's only a matter of time. So in the future, the problem is not going to be trying to get people to go out there and fill all the jobs that need filled. 
uh, the problem is going to be trying to provide people with a means of survival in uh, a post-work world. Uh, do, you, do you find those concerns compelling? I am not really sold on the job apocalypse uh, concept myself, simply because it's been something that people have been talking about for decades, even centuries, and it never seems to happen. And uh, it doesn't happen for a good reason, and that is because people find other things uh, to do with their time than consume the kinds of goods and services that can be produced by automation. For example, back in the 1930s, um, John Maynard Keynes wrote a famous essay, The Economic Lives of Our Grandchildren, I think the title of it was, in which he predicted that by our own time, he said people would only need to work 14 hours a week to satisfy their needs for uh, food, clothing, uh, all of the material goods that we consume. And it turns out that he was exactly, almost exactly right. It turns out that 14 hours a week really is just about what we need on average to produce all of the material goods that we consume. So why are we still working 40 hours a week? We're doing 40 hours a week because we're doing some things that um, Keynes uh, didn't quite anticipate. For example, let's suppose that your idea of uh, uh, a um, scintillating leisure time activity is playing poker. Uh, so I think Keynes' idea was that after you worked your 14 hours a week, two seven-hour days, that you'd go home on Wednesday and you'd call up your buddies and you'd get together and sit down at a poker table in their kitchen and you'd play poker. Um, well, a lot of people play poker or do other forms of card games and gambling, but it turns out they don't do those in each other's kitchens. Instead, they go to the casinos. Why do people prefer to work long hours at some tiring job that they don't really like in order to be able to go to the casino and gamble their money in the casino when they could take uh, when they could work less and play the same poker game around their uh, uh, around the tables uh, in their friend's house? We don't know why people like to do those things. Personally, I love to play cards at my friend's house. I never go to a casino, but. Uh, I think we can't quite predict what people are going to do with their leisure time. And one of the things people do with their leisure time is they engage in what I call market mediated leisure. Uh, they don't go out and play soccer. They watch soccer matches. Uh, they don't uh, take singing lessons and gather around the piano and sing songs with their friends like they used to back in Schubert's, Schubert's time. And instead they uh, go to concerts or buy uh, expensive electronic equipment to play music on. So I don't know. Um, people didn't anticipate those in the past. I don't think we can anticipate what people will use when the job apocalypse comes. So we've got a few other questions on different topics in the chat, but just a quick follow-up to that. One of the uh, objections that uh, tends to come from the political right in response to pure uh, basic income proposals is the idea that work is not merely instrumentally valuable as a way of obtaining cash that we can then use to play poker or whatever it is we want to spend with it, but that work has some sort of intrinsic value that it's a, um, it, it's a source of social connections in our lives and also a source of personal meaning for us. So the point of that, that line of argument is to, I think, emphasize the importance of incentivizing people to work or at least not disincentivizing them regardless of, to some extent, regardless of how much there, how much work there is that needs to be done for some instrumental purposes. Do you, do you find those kinds of concerns compelling as well? Uh, are, those, are those reflected in any way in your, in your emphasis on the importance of work incentives or is that, is that a purely instrumentalist concern? Um, I think to a degree, yes. There are people, uh, of course the work has an intrinsic value and, um, uh, a great many people work more than they need to to meet their material needs. Um, and that can be true not only for people that work in uh, uh, creative arts or people that work um, in uh, things that uh, have an inherent social component, people that like to go to the office because they like to meet their friends around the water cooler. Uh, but it also occurs even for people in some low-wage occupations. We have a good friend who's a checkout 
a clerk at the local grocery store who has an adequate retirement income. She works in the grocery store just because she likes to get out of the house. So uh, work does have intrinsic reward. I think that can be uh, exaggerated. Um, I think that there are some kind of work, some, some kinds of work that um, are uh, even uh, demeaning or uh, inherently uh, distasteful that if we could automate them out of existence, that would probably be handy. And I would say, uh, I would emphasize um, a little bit compared to the uh, conservative system. Um, if people want to choose to work less, I don't think that they should be seen as uh, being morally inferior. Good. So uh, Miranda Fleischer has a question about uh, funding for your program of uh, integrated cash assistance. Um, so part of that proposal that you laid out is um, involves replacing uh, currently existing uh, means tested uh, cash assistance programs and in kind benefits like SNAP and TA and um, with this with this basic grant. Would that be enough to adequately fund the proposals that you set forth, or would require would we require additional funding sources? And if, as I suspect, it's the latter, um, what would those funding sources be on on your view? Well, um, th the question is, can we afford integrated cash assistance or universal basic income or any other program like this? I think that's not quite the right question. The question I like to ask is how much integrated cash assistance or how much universal basic income could we afford uh, if we spent just the money that we spend now on places on programs that could be replaced by the new system. That provides a sort of a benchmark. My calculation is that if we had an integrated cash assistant program um, that we used the current income support money to provide a basic grant, we used current child support money to provide a child grant, and current um, money that we use to provide the earned income tax credit, we spread that out uh, to provide a tax credit, uh, not a tax credit, but monthly payments that would be available uh, both to people with and without children and would include a child payment. I think if we used those sources, and those would, by the way, include some things that I call middle class welfare, things like um, the mortgage interest deduction, which after all is a form of income support itself. Uh, if we're going to take away the food stamps of the poor and replace them with a basic income, we certainly, there's no reason uh, to continue to give the middle class both their mortgage interest deduction and their new cash grant. They get the new cash grant instead of their basic income. If we did that, I think that what we could get out of that would be a basic grant that would be about equal to uh, the uh, individual uh, to the level that the Census Department calls deep poverty level. If we add uh, work incentives to that, uh, I mean, if we add the work, um, um, the, if we add the wage subsidy component to that, if we add a child allowance, uh, we would get a program that would approximately uh, equal the uh, official federal poverty level for a family of four. And it would be enough to raise at least three quarters of people out of poverty. It would be enough to leave everybody in the bottom half of the income distribution better off than they are now. Uh, if we want to add more than that, that's fine. I'm, I, uh, I'm only a technician. I'm sitting in the sidelines offering advice in this discussion. Uh, real citizens are discussing whether they want to pay more taxes or ask for more taxes. There's plenty of things we could tax. We could tax carbon. That'd be a great idea. I'm all for that. Uh, we could tax more consumption, uh, put more taxes on consumption, less on income. Could modify our uh, investment taxes. Um, I've written on uh, various reasons why um, the idea of preferential um, tax rates for uh, dividends and capital gains are a bad idea. So we could squeeze uh, more money out of the system if we wanted to. After all, the United States is a very, very low tax country compared to our high income 
peers in uh, Europe and Asia and so forth. So Samuel asks a, an interesting question in chat. Is this, is this something that has to be done on the federal level, or do you think that states could experiment with programs of integrated cash assistance as well? States could experiment with some of these programs, but I don't think they would be able to go too much beyond uh, experimentation. There are a couple reasons for that. Um, one is that um, if we get too much fragmentation in uh, the way these programs are conducted among the states, we start uh, chipping away at mobility and we um, stop becoming one country. We already have trouble with programs like Medicaid, uh, which is a sort of a federal program that's administered on the state level. It has one of the disadvantages of that is that unintentionally it makes it hard for people to move from state to state. Other state administered programs like occupational licensing also create these barriers. So I don't want to go too far in that because I think that uh, Americans should remain uh, have the not only right but capability to move from New York to California or Wyoming to Montana if they want to. But the other really bigger reason, which is really being laid bare by this crisis, is that individual states, um, not only um, by uh, their own constitutions, but as an economic reality, have to, have to operate with balanced budgets. Uh, not only do state constitutions uh, prevent a large deficit spending, but um, states can't issue their own money. There's no state by state uh, equivalent of the uh, California reserve system that can print California dollars uh, like they used to, by the way. A lot of people don't know that during the Civil War, California decided to print its own currency, not to go along with the national system, little known fact of economic history. We don't want to go back to those days. So uh, over the course of the business cycle, we can't run the system without federal participation because we can't get along uh, without a unified fiscal system. The European Union has really shown uh, the impossibility, the infeasibility of uh, running a system that has an integrated monetary system and a fragmented fiscal system. It just doesn't work. Interesting. Very th thank you. Uh, let's see. I've got uh, another question here. Uh, this was from Alex. Um, so you've talked a lot about... Um, transfer uh, policies that could be adopted to uh, help people cope with the crisis. Uh, and of course, transfer policies have been one of the major features of uh, both the CARES Act and, uh, and proposed new legislation. Uh, but there are also a number of uh, regulatory proposals that uh, uh, various um, localities have proposed. Alex says that uh, in his town, um, People are proposing uh, a freeze on uh, rent increases as well as a ban on evictions. Um, so is that, is that a, in your view, who wants to know, uh, an appropriate um, element of the overall safety net, uh, not just transferring, but also opposing regulations on um, businesses and, uh, and other economic agents? Um, I think things like, um, <clears throat> In the current crisis, uh, things like uh, rent holidays and uh, uh, mortgage relief have been a necessary uh, part of the response, but I don't think that they're on the whole desirable. I think it's better uh, to uh, transfer funds to renters and allow them to pay their rent. Uh, part of the reason for that there's two reasons for that. One is that not all landlords are wealthy people. Uh, and uh, when we stop paying rents, uh, the, uh, the, the companies that are renting the houses themselves get into financial problems, either because they're some individual that just has one uh, house or one apartment that they're renting, or even if they're corporations, uh, they uh, have uh, 
they have their own obligations. I was just reading in the paper today about some uh, large landlord in New York that has uh, has number of tenants who are not paying their rent, and uh, they have a quarterly, uh, a huge quarterly tax payment coming due that they're simply not going to be able to meet. So they're going to have to, uh, if um, some something happens, they become insolvent. Um, so that's that's my opinion in regard to those. Furthermore, uh, when we talk about rent relief or mortgage forbearance, we're really uh, only postponing those payments. When people things go back to normal, people go back to work, they're going to have uh, huge uh, obligations to pay off uh, past lease obligations or past mortgage obligations. Those are going to take years to unwind. So, so here's a, a challenging question. Um, the proposal that you put forward sets out this kind of flexible framework um, that we can dial up and down as need be, right? So we've got the television always on. People are plugged in even in normal times uh, so that they can receive um, a cash grant or wage subsidies depending on their income level. And if a pandemic comes along, we can dial the system up for a while, get people more money while they need it. And then once the crisis is passed, we can dial it back down. Uh, and from a purely theoretical economic standpoint, that sounds great. Politically, how feasible do you think that is? And how worried are you that, um, quote the old adage, there's nothing so permanent as a temporary government program? In other words, how easy is it going to be for us to go back to normal after we've instituted all these relief measures um, in a time of crisis? Uh, whether we're ever going to be able to dial this program down if we dial it up once. Uh, well, of course, um, that's, a, that's a question which is existing now in this current program. Um, we put time limits on these things, but unfortunately, politics being what they are, yes, it's hard to... Uh, 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 politics does tend to be short-sighted and to make promises in the short run until the next election is over, which it then doesn't want to withdraw. We have a long history of that and we have to fight against it. Um, as far as the political feasibility, though, of instituting a system that does some things like this, um, there's more interest in the idea of some kind of a system that's based more on cash grants and less on means tested welfare than there has been before. Uh, things like these uh, programs like the Harris and uh, the program Harris Sanders Markey uh, idea for cash grants is an example on the left. And I think it's quite striking that people like uh, Holly and uh, Mitt Romney on the right are even entertaining uh, the very idea of even temporary cash grants, I think that there's um, a, a, a dam uh, breaking in that regard. Yeah, and yeah I agree. It's, uh, it's interesting times that we are, we're living in and, and policy options that, uh, that seemed unthinkable um, in, the, in the relatively recent past are... Uh, I should add one thing in here. As, uh, with regard to the idea of if we turn on the spigot during a crisis, can we ever turn it off again? Um, in the monetary sphere, we have the Federal Reserve, which, uh, much to everybody's amazement, has been successful in doing that. Uh, people say that the job of the Federal Reserve is to take away the punch bowl when uh, the party is just as it's going well. And the Federal Reserve has an amazing track record of doing that, even though people don't like it. Uh, and that's promising. If we could get partway there in the fiscal realm, that would be good. And there are countries that have done this. Uh, countries like uh, Sweden back in the 1990s had a terrible debt problem, and they instituted um, a uh, cross-party a fiscal policy board that has kept a uh, fiscal house in order there pretty well. Uh, Chile has done something like it. We have the German debt break. Some countries have figured out ways to control fiscal policy uh, and rein in uh, their spend thrift pop politicians that are elected uh, thinking no farther ahead than the next election. Do you think some degree of political insulation is necessary for that? I mean, that seems to be a, a large part of what accounts for the feds 
independence. Is that something we can mimic in, in fiscal policy? Uh, some countries have managed to do that. Okay. Whether we could or not, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, Robert Orr wants to ask you about uh, baby bond uh, type proposals and uh, if you okay thinking about these. And maybe you could explain for those who are unfamiliar what, what baby bonds are. Uh, I could persuade what baby bonds are. Um, I don't know what baby bonds are and uh, what Robert means by them. I think the idea is that um, the uh, idea is that we should give a lump sum uh, cash uh, grant to parents uh, at the time that people are born, in which they can invest in their uh, children's education. But uh, I, uh, there's also an idea that we should have, uh, uh, we give everybody a big bond on their uh, 21st or 18th birthday to uh, set them out in the world. But uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure what Robert's uh, proposal is. Here. Something along the lines of a, of a demo grant type proposal. Well, maybe Robert can yeah. explain further if, if uh, he meant something different. Um, one last question that I had um, as we start to wrap things up here. Uh, how optimistic are you, uh, and this is taking you out of your ex area of expertise into the area of, uh, of, of wild speculation and prediction, how optimistic are you that, uh, that we're gonna get things broadly in the ballpark of right uh, in terms of our political response to this crisis uh, in the United States? Um, I, I know you've got some criticisms of the CARES Act. Uh, do you think we're gonna um, mend things going forward in a way that corrects those uh, those defects from your point of view, or do you think we're just going to continue along the same um, flawed path or maybe even make things worse? I'm cautiously encouraged by the speed with which uh, the government has reacted to this crisis and by the degree uh, to which the uh, deficit hawks have uh, gone back to their perches, uh, at least temporarily, uh, that's encouraging. Uh, but on the other hand, there have been some uh, discouraging things already that we've seen. The uh, whole rent-seeking tendencies of the country are out uh, on uh, review in this, and everybody's trying to grab a piece of the pie. The the uh, results of the payroll protection uh, system are cautionary. Uh, are, are cautionary. Uh, the uh, short-sightedness of uh, many politicians in their reactions to public discontent about uh, the stay-at-home orders and so forth is uh, uh, makes me cautious about whether we're going to get anything right. I think that. If we make, uh, I don't think we're going to get some vast, uh, I, as a practical matter, we're not going to get some vast uh, perfect system out of this all in uh, one fell swoop. But we may get uh, a step forward, uh, which uh, in some ways resembles what happened during uh, the, the New Deal. Uh, I've just been reading Caro's biography of uh, Lyndon Johnson and his uh, as a young representative during the New Deal, and a lot of laws were passed with great hope to bring the railroads under control. For example, in the New Deal, uh, railroads were seen as being uh, people that were going to be crushed by this wave of New Deal regulations. But it turned out that the rent-seeking power of the railroads was underestimated by the New Dealers. And a new generation of New Dealers uh, had to come in in the 1970s uh, and 80s and uh, fix the legislation that had been passed during the New Deal that built these uh, rent-seeking castles for truckers and uh, railroad people and so forth. And so we had to have a wave of deregulation uh, to undo some of the very well-intentioned programs of the New Dealers. I don't think that we're going to get there in one step by any means, but I hope maybe we'll come out of this with some uh, significant improvements. Well, on that note of cautious optimism, uh, I think we'll, we'll wrap up our conversation here. Ed, it's been a real pleasure uh, talking with you. Uh, I hope, uh, hope 
someday in the future, people can have a chance to meet each other again in person and you and I can have the chance to meet each other again. But thank you for, uh, for sharing your expertise with us today. Uh, I wanna recommend to all of you that, uh, uh, that readings that Ed suggested to you on his slides earlier on. Uh, if you'd like to learn uh, more about his proposals, you could read about them uh, on his website uh, and at the Niskanen Center. Uh, speaking of the Niskanen Center, thanks very much to the Niskanen Center for co-hosting with us. And thanks to all of you for joining us in our discussion today. We'll be posting this video on uh, the YouTube channel of the Center for Ethics, Economics, and Public Policy, uh, where you can also find videos of our past lectures and debates. So thanks, Ed. Thanks to Niskanen. And uh, thanks again to all of you. And thank you, Matt, for uh, setting this whole thing up. And thanks for the folks at uh, Niskanen for enabling it. Absolutely. My pleasure. Have a great day, everybody.